Good afternoon, I'm Imogen Bakra and welcome to this COP26 debrief, giving you bite-sized insight on the latest COP26 discussions and developments. I'm joined today by our climate and ESG specialists, James Close and Caroline Haas, who have been on the ground at COP26 and are just back to give us their key takeaways. Today was the final day of COP26, so we'll reflect on the diverse range of voices we've heard from all over the world this past fortnight and what this COP ultimately means for businesses. So James, governments globally have said that we need to be more ambitious if we're to achieve net zero by 2030, and the task for the UK presidency was to persuade countries to set more ambitious pledges for this year's COP. Do you feel like the pledges that have been made during these past couple of weeks are actually more ambitious? Are 2030 and 2050 emissions targets now more ambitious, measurable and verifiable? Well, thanks, Imogen. We won't quite know until the texts are all complete. But and by the time our listeners uh, hear this, I think there will be a bit more progress. But certainly the direction of travel is that we're going to come out of this COP with more momentum than we went come, going into it. And I think that's a really powerful signal that we have to uh, increase our ambition. And I think there's a whole series of areas where things have been strengthened. It's been really interesting to see reference to fossil fuels for the first time in a COP, and hopefully that will stay there in the cover document when that's uh, completed. And at the same time, uh, there's been a mention of coal and, and phasing out coal. And again, uh, that seems to be sticking into the text, which is a, a very good signal as well. I think probably the most important thing will be a more regular updating of ambitions. Uh, from Paris, it was every five years, and the proposal will be that we uh, increase our ambition every year. Uh, and at the same time, there will be more uh, transparency over what's reported um, so that civil society and others can really uh, get into the uh, details of those commitments and work out whether they're going to get us onto that one and a half degree trajectory, which is so important for us. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is that the COP, of course, is about global equity. It's about the relationship between the developed countries and the developing countries. And so much of this COP has been around finance. Um, and I think it's uh, really important to see uh, the commitments that the developed countries make to support developing countries, not only to decarbonize their economies, but also to protect themselves from uh, the climate uh, change that is already baked in. And that really does uh, link to the poorest and the most vulnerable who've contributed least to, to climate change. I think that point about finance brings me nicely onto what I want to ask you, Caroline, which is that this importance of mobilising finance in reducing emissions and protecting the vulnerable has been a dominant discussion theme across the last two weeks. As we get to the end of negotiations, do you feel like there is investment and green financing strategies in place to actually accelerate progress and achieve targets? Yes, I mean, I have to say the, the last two weeks just seeing what has happened is quite extraordinary. Obviously, there are steps that we're going to have to take. But, you know, finance has really come on board and uh, there is absolutely the intent when you look at some of the um, collaborations that have happened with chief fans and, you know, some of the numbers are obviously enormous at $130 trillion, but nevertheless, the intent is very much there. Um, and now it's more looking at some of the details and working through those, thinking about what is de-risking, um, who is going to take what part of that risk as we finance out for long-term projects um, with regard to infrastructure, and also sort of thinking about you know, what other types of products are there that we can use? What does blended finance mean? What is the role between private and public finance? But, you know, the intent is now very much to get around the table and really solve those individual issues as we try to solve the bigger issue or the bigger problem. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely walk away thinking that we are mobilized to ensure that capital starts to flow. Thanks. Very exciting. So NatWest's recent Springboard to Sustainability report stated that half the UK's carbon reduction ambition can be delivered by the country's SME sector. James, after speaking with companies here, do you think that they feel a renewed impetus to double down on sustainability? And do you really feel encouraged by the um, this COP session that there's enough um, help and clarity on targets for them? Mm. Well, I think it's worth uh, emphasising that the UK really has a leading position in 
uh, its ambition to decarbonize the economy based on the work that we've already done um, uh, uh, you know to date so I think uh, the opportunity is certainly there uh, for the business community and the small and medium-sized enterprise a key part of that uh, in two regards I think one how can we build sustainable supply chains for big businesses that are going to be under huge scrutiny uh, from investors um, and how they're going to get access to services and goods that uh, have got thoughtful decarbonization and uh, sustainability plans associated with them. So that's a, that's a great opportunity for small and medium sized enterprises. And our Springboard success report suggested that uh, the revenue opportunity could be up to $160 billion um, and it could in fact create 130,000 jobs as well. Uh, so I think there's a significant recognition that uh, small and medium sized enterprises really are part of the solution. And of course, the innovation that's required to take us to this uh, decarbonized future is going to become come from uh, businesses that don't exist today or, or at very early stages. Uh, and again, I think it's really important for those to get access to the capital that they need to enable them to grow as quickly, as effectively as possible so that they can come up with the innovation and new technologies that are going to be so important. And I think finally, to Caroline's point, uh, they can also be a huge uh, help in emerging markets and developing countries um, as those countries are able to get access to that technology in a cost effective way. So to wrap this up, then I've got a question for both of you. Uh, perhaps, James, you can go first and then Caroline to follow. But really, what do you both feel was the biggest takeaway from this COP session? And what conditions do you think that businesses will be operating in over the next few decades? Mm. Well, I think two things, Imogen. One, um, everybody is now talking about the importance of climate action and the urgency of it. There is no question of the science. Um, that is a really significant step forward. Um, and the second thing I think is that uh, if we're going to do what we need to do, which is enormous when you think about halving emissions by 2030, we have to change the way in which we work and the system that we're operating in. And I think that really signals to collaboration like our lives depended on it. And if I'm honest, they really do. And certainly the lives of the next generation. So hopefully we can all work together to really drive the agenda and scale up our ambition. And same to you then, Caroline. All right, well, I, I, I'll start right where James ended. I think collaboration. I think it's where really the big message that came through that we can't do this on our own. You can't do it in a country, let alone as a individual company or as an individual. But actually, if you all work together, and that's literally from the consumer through to the banks, to the industry, and then up to policy, and then obviously onto a global scale, um, we really do have a chance. And uh, we just need to kind of really sort of put some of the sort of smaller issues that we each have aside and really sort of realize that there's a much bigger task at hand and to collaborate around that. Um, the other point I think that really stuck in my mind, and Alison Rose had said this multiple times, is that we're really a rewiring the global economy. And I think, you know, it goes to the point, this is an enormous task, um, but uh, it, it will be better for all of us in the future. And that's why we need to think about the next generations. We need to think about other communities, etc but it is going to really be a rewiring. It's gonna have an impact on the economies, on GDP, on everything as we kind of think about the normal progress of our lives. Um, and so it's, it, those are sort of the two big um, key takeaways for me. Thanks, Imogen. Sounds like we're at an important juncture then. All right, thank you both. I think that's all for this COP26 video cast. Thank you, James and Caroline for joining me. Uh, and for those insights, fresh from COP26, where you've been for the last two weeks. Uh, and thank you for the viewers for joining us as well. If you'd like more views and actionable ideas on the trends shaping the business landscape, then please subscribe to our social channels for more. See you again soon.